Hello, welcome to this lecture on Towards Pain-Free Hospital Implementation in Emergency Department. Before we start, let's look at this situation. The patient complained about pain when moving her shoulder, and the doctor jokingly tell her not to do it. We may find this funny, but often we too, during our day-to-day -day practice, seems to be insensitive towards patient's pain. When we are talking about pain, do you know that pain is the most common reason for patient visits to ED? Pain is the chief complaint up to 78% of the time. Now what is pain exactly? Pain is actually an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or describes in terms of such damage. So what does it mean to the healthcare provider? Well, it basically means that it's an unpleasant experience, there are emotions involved, and the cause is not always visible. Now, severe acute pain can cause multiple adverse effects. This includes cardiovascular system, respiratory system, gastrointestinal, general and musculoskeletal, psychological, and neuroplasticity. For example, if a person is having severe pain, there is an increased sympathetic activity, and that causes the heart rate to raise. In a person with existing ischemic heart disease, where his myocardial supply is limited, this will mean that there will be a tipping of a myocardial oxygen demand which can lead to myocardial infarction. Another example for severe acute pain is the psychological effect, where it causes anxiety and fear, and that causes sleeplessness and helplessness, and eventually causes psychological stress. Now on to the topic of pain as vital sign. In 2008, Ministry of Health Malaysia has made pain as the fifth vital sign as a nationwide policy. That means, beside temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure, pain score is also an important vital sign. Now let's take a look at another clinical situation. This is a typical Passover that is occurring in our ED from day to day basis. We stand at the end of the bed and pass over the cases. Now look at what the doctor will say. Patient is stable, temperature is 37 degree, pulse rate 88, respiratory rate 16, BP 110, 70. But if we look at the patient, she's in pain. And what is she thinking? Now the doctor has told her that he gave something for the pain, but her abdomen still hurts. If we look at the Passover, it was not mentioned, and this is exactly what's wrong with our practice these days. If you look at the five vital signs, four of them, namely the temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure, offers no communication with the patient. These are the vital signs that you obtain by measurement. A pain assessment has the benefit to promote provider patient's interaction. That's the interaction between doctors and patient, nurses and patient. And then it provides better patient care and it makes us better aware of the pain. The barrier to pain management is inadequate pain assessment and the lack of awareness. I'll quote Dr. Samuel Johnson saying, those who do not feel pain seldom think that it is felt. So how do we approach pain? A simple model is the RAT model or the RAT model. RAT stands for R, recognize, A, to assess, and T, to treat. What do we recognize? Does the patient have pain? Do other people know that the patient has pain? Then we assess what type of pain it is, how severe is the pain, are there other factors. Eventually, we will treat this. 
what non-drug treatment can I use and what drugs treatment can I use. So let's talk about pain classification or the types of pain. We can divide the type of pain by duration, mechanism and by cause. If we're talking about duration, that can be acute, chronic, or acute on chronic. If we're talking about mechanism, it can be nociceptive or neuropathic. On to the cause of pain, there can be cancer pain or non-cancer pain. Now, let's look at the pain pathway. The pain starts at the site of injury, and then it is transferred along the spinal cord and eventually perceived in the brain. The understanding of this pathway is important because treatment of pain can be applied at the site of injury, during its transfer at the level of spinal cord, or in the brain where it is being perceived. Talking about acute versus chronic pain. Acute pain is the pain where the onset is recent and the pain disappears when tissue heals. Its duration is limited and often with a visible tissue injury. The severity correlates with the amount of damages and usually present itself as a symptom. Its psychological effect is less because it improves with pain relief. Now chronic pain, on the other hand, has insidious onset. That, that means the appearance of chronic pain is not very apparent. The pain persists beyond tissue healing and usually lasts more than three months. When it became a chronic pain, the cause is often no longer identifiable and it doesn't correlate with the damages that occurs. There is no warning sign of tissue damage and now the chronic pain itself became a disease. This often associates with depression, anger, fear and social withdrawal. If we look at the pain pathway again and try to understand where acute pain and chronic pains occur, then we can see that acute pain is usually at the site of injury. Chronic pain can originate from the spinal cord or being perceived in the brain. The common causes of acute pain can include trauma that can be related to, for example, fracture or recent surgery, burns. Acute pain can also be related to inflammative processes like arthritis and infections like abscesses. Severe acute pain can also be results from ischemic events like myocardial infarction or from mechanical pain like labor pain and childbirth. Common causes of chronic pain include chronic headache, chronic back pain, chronic abdominal pain, chronic pelvic and hip pain, or chronic cancer pain. The second type of pain classification is the nociceptive versus neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is the physiological pain. It is well localized as obvious tissue injury or illness. Usually it is sharp in nature and worse with movement and often related to inflammation. The neuropathic pain is a pathological pain. It is not well localized. The tissue injury is not obvious. Usually the sensation is burning, shooting, numb, pins and needles. The cause is usually related to nerve injury, whether it's change in wiring, abnormal firing, or loss in modulation. Neuropathic pain is defined as pain that is caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. So, for example, in the peripheral nervous system, the traumatic brachial plexus injury or neuropathic pain in diabetic mellitus. The other examples are carpal tunnel syndrome and post-herpetic neuralgia. As for the central nervous system, we can see the neuropathic pain from central post-stroke pain.
Another example is neuropathy associated with spinal cord injury. The common causes of acute neuropathic pain includes acute shingles, spinal cord injury, and brachial plexus injury. The example of common causes of chronic neuropathic pain includes post-hepatic neuralgia, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and post-stroke pain. Now when we talk about cancer versus non-cancer pain, the cancer pain usually are progressive and it may mix acute and chronic pain, whereas non-cancerous pain usually has many different causes and it can be acute or chronic. Besides knowing the type of pain, it is also crucial to know how to measure or assess pain severity. Now, why is it important? This is because if we are able to assess pain, we will be able to set the pain score as the baseline for our intervention or treatment. Knowing the pain severity also facilitates communication between staff looking after the patient. And it is also easier for documentation. So how do we assess pain? First, we need to listen and believe the patient. Take the pain history by an open-end question like, tell me about your pain. From this question, we are looking for the site of pain, what is the aggravating factors, how is the intensity of the pain, what is its nature, and what is the neutralizing factors. To know specifically where is the site of pain, we ask, where does it hurt? To know more about aggravating factors, we ask, what makes your pains worse? To know about intensity, we ask, how bad is the pain? If we want to know the nature of the pain, then we ask, what does it feel like? And about neutralizing factors, we ask, what makes the pain better? Now, when should pain be assessed? Pain should be assessed on schedule observation during vital sign taking at regular interval. For example, every four hourly or every six hourly. Beside the schedule observation, pain should be assessed on admission of the patient, on transfer of patient, or whenever a patient complains of pain. Now, if you have given a treatment or intervention for pain relief, pain assessment should be done half to one hour after analgesia or nursing intervention for pain relief. Pain also should be assessed during and after any painful procedure. For example, during and after wound dressing. Now, who should we assess for pain? We should assess all patients. That includes all the patients in the emergency department, in the recovery room of operating theatres, in the labour room, ambulatory daycare units, wards, ICU, HDU, CCU, and even clinics. Who does the pain assessment? All of the hospital staff should do it. That includes nurses and paramedics, or doctors, allied health personnel, and healthcare trainee, like medical or nursing students. Now on to the clinical techniques for measurements of pain. There are two main types of pain measurement, the self-reporting and the observer assessment. Self-reporting pain measurement is done by the patient. It is the gold standard of pain measurement, hence it is the best method. Observer assessment is done by the staff. It is done by looking at the behavior and taking consideration of the vital signs. It is a kind of functional assessment. Now to assess pain, we need some tools. How do we select a good pain assessment tool? We should select a standard tool for pain assessment and we should use an appropriate scale. When doing assessment, 
the tool must be appropriate for the age, learning and development of the patient. And we should always use the same tool for the same patient for consistency. Here is an example of the suitable pain assessment tool for different age group. For adults with normal cognition, we can use the Ministry of Health pain scale. For those with impaired cognition, we can use the phase scale or the FLACC scale. For pediatrics patient aged between 1 month to 3 years, where the patient could not communicate their pain well, an observer assessment tool like FLACC scale should be used. For pediatric patient aged between 3 years to 7 years who are able to communicate, especially via graphical manner, we can use the face scale. For patient more than 7 years who can speak well, we can use the Ministry of Health in scale. This is the Ministry of Health pain scale. There is a label of 0 to 10 with a slider. To use this tool, we ask the patient to rate the pain on the scale of 0 to 10 and explain that 0 is no pain and 10 is the worst pain one can imagine. And then the patient is asked to slide the indicator along the scale to the pain that they are experiencing and then we will record the pain as number. In this slide, we can see the phase scale. The top one is the Ministry of Health phase scale, which is adapted to the scale of 0 to 10, whereas the lower one is the Wong Baker phase scale with the scale of 0 to 5. We are using the MOH phase scale with the scale of 10. This is suitable for children between 3 to 7 years old or cognitive impaired patient. Patient is asked to point on the face representing his current pain and we will record the pain as number. For FLACC scale, which is an observer assessment scale, we observe the behaviour by looking at the face, leg, activity, the cry and consolability. Each of the category is scored from 0 to 2, which the results in total will be scored between 0 to 10. For example, for children with the face showing no particular expression or are able to smile, we will give the score of 0, whereas a child with occasional grimace or frown will be given 1 mark. Let us look at this video to learn how to use the FLACC score. F for face. So let's look at the face of the child. He is in constant grimace and I would like to give the score of 2. Next we look at the leg. During straining his legs is in a tense position and I would like to give it 1 score. Next. A for activity. The child appeared to be tense and are not doing his usual activity. That would give him a score of 1. C for cry and we can see that he is constantly whimpering from the pain and that is a score of 1. Eventually, we will look at the C for consolability. So let us observe a little bit longer. You can see that the nurse wipes the child and he appears to be a little bit more comfortable. But I would like to observe a little bit longer. You can see the mom patting on the back and now he demands a hug. And, and that makes him feel better. So that is one score, one mark. That would give us a total of 6 marks, 2 marks for face, 1 marks for leg, 1 marks for activity, 1 marks for cry, and 1, one marks for consolability. Sometimes there are patients who are unable to be assessed. 
for example, a patient who is sedated or unconscious, we will record this as unable to assess or unable to score. Next, I would like to talk about acute pain management. In emergency department at the triage, we use the same principle, which is recognize, assess, treat, and triage. So pain assessment is done at different stages, including primary triage, secondary triage, waiting area, and tertiary zones. In the primary triage, we will diagnose the pain by stereotyping, grading its pain, and asking the frequently asked question. In the secondary triage, we do a quick assessment, takes the vital sign using the pain scale, including usage of Ministry of Health, pain scale, phases scale, or objective assessment like FLACC. At the waiting area, the supervisor will perform eagle eye observation for surveillance. In the tertiary zone, pain assessment is done on arrival, during scheduled observation, when the patient complain of pain, or after analgesia and nursing intervention for pain relief, or during or after painful procedures. To manage the pain, we have two main methods, pharmacological and non-drugs methods. Pharmacological agents include non-opioids, opioids, and antineuropathics. Non-opioids medication includes acetaminophen like paracetamol, NSAIDs like diclofenac, ibuprofen, methamphetamic acid, or COX-2 specific inhibitor like celecoxic. Opioids include weak opioids like tramadol and strong opioids like morphine and fentanyl. Antineuropathics agent includes antidepressant, anticonvulsive agents like gabapentin, serotonin receptor inhibitor like dulocetin, and other agents like ketamine and tenox. We treat acute pain according to analgesic ladder. Uh, in this ladder, you can see there is a stepwise increment in pain medication. For mild pain scoring 1 to 3, we can give regular paracetamol plus minus NSAIDs. For moderate pain, pain score ranging from 4 to 6, we can give weak opioids like tramadol plus minus paracetamol or NSAIDs. For severe pain with the pain score of 7 to 10, we start with regular doses of IV or subcutaneous morphine or the alternative of aqueous morphine. Paracetamol and NSAID can be added to this for synergistic effect. If the pain is still uncontrolled, we can refer to acute pain service where PCA or epidural analgesia can be given. For non-drug treatments, it includes physical treatment and psychological treatment. Physical treatment includes physical support, immobilization, compression, ice, elevation, massage, hydrotherapy, acupuncture, and tents. For psychological treatment, it includes empathy, explanation, reassurance, counseling, distraction, music, relaxation, and guided imagery. Let's take a look at some of the physical methods. For a sportsman with a knee pain, they apply ice or elevation. Massage can be done to relieve the pain. For folks with osteoarthritis, hydrotherapy is a good method of pain relief and improve joint mobility. Here is an example of acupuncture being used to relieve knee pain. And this is a TENS device to provide stimulation to the muscles. Here are some psychological methods. It is actually very effective to show the baby shark dance video 
to a young children to distract them from pain. Otherwise, music and relaxation are equally effective. Some designers use guided imagery such as wallpaper with soothing surrounding to ease the pain. Now I'm going to show you a video example of usage of distracting methods on children receiving vaccines. Agora o fruto de fogo. Mas ó, vamos lá. Bem rapidinho. Pera aí, deixa eu pegar aqui. Now, when we're talking about analgesia, as I've told you before, analgesia can work at different level. The example of pharmacological treatment are working at periphery level it includes anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs and local anesthetic agent. For non-drug methods working at peripheral level includes rest, immobilization, cold compression and elevation. Example of analgesia at spinal cord level. For pharmacological, it includes local anesthetics, opioids and ketamines. Where else for non-drug methods, it includes acupuncture and massage. As for the example of analgesia working at brain level, for pharmacological agents, it includes paracetamol, opioids, amitriptyline, clonidine. Where else for non-drug methods, it is the psychological methods. And this concludes my lecture on implementation of pain-free hospital in emergency department. Thank you very much for your attention.